A leaked document shows the Biden administration plans to limit civilian gun exports to Israel and Ukraine. Plus, a candid conversation about gun suicide with the traces Mike Spees. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no hold on me. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gatowski, also the founder of the Reload and a CNN contributor. You can, of course, always head over to the reload.com if you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America. We send out a weekly free newsletter that gives you the top lines of what you need to know. Uh, and of course, we also offer a membership for people who want to support our reporting and get a bunch of extra uh, analysis and stories that you won't find anywhere else. So you can head over to the reload and find all that today. This week, uh, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I mean, first of all, Merry Christmas. I think this will go live probably the day after Christmas, uh, even though Christmas is on a Monday. We'll probably I'll probably push it to Tuesday. Members will still get it on Sunday like they always do. But um, yeah, we'll probably go public on on Tuesday just uh, to give people that that time to celebrate Christmas without you know uh, listening to the podcast. But um, it'll also be a bit different because. Uh, it's a, I don't know, it's, a, it's more of a personal story. I'm personally connected to this this story that we're going to be discussing uh, with with the author. We have with us uh, a senior staff writer for the Trace, Mike Spees. Well, welcome to the show, Mike. First, uh, thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Stephen. Very very happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And and actually, before we get into the story, let's talk just a, a little bit about the Trace. Um, you know, I, I've talked about the Trace before. Obviously, we we link to your your guys' reporting when it uh, on occasion when I when I think there's a really good story or, or something relevant that you guys are 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 covering. Um, people in the industry, like uh, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is part of this this story we're going to get into, don't like you guys because of um, your funding sources that you have. Uh, Every town was a, a founding funder for you and provides some funding to the organization today. Um, but you maintain a editorial independence, right? That they don't have a say over what kind of stories you publish. Correct. Yeah, and at this point, you know, every town is one of a pretty vast number of funders. But it is true they provided our seed funding. But we have a, as with every other person who contributes money to the trace, there's a very clear and impenetrable editorial firewall, uh, and uh, the two sides do not ever connection for me so okay. all money that we get um like any other journalism nonprofit is you know it's no strings attached money it's just the money is there the money is the money it's true we, we yeah. disclose it we try to be as transparent about it as possible right it is disclosed on your website and i would say like editorially you have a different approach than than we do at the reload you know just from the uh the background that you come from and the stories that you guys prioritize um uh, it's yeah, just a different true. editorial approach. Uh, and and I think that, and honestly, the, you know, I, I know that upsets people in the industry or people uh, on the, the gun rights side of things, and that's fine. Um, to me, when I look at reporting, um, I feel like if you're transparent about uh, your, your, you know, your funding for one, and then also your editorial point of view, it doesn't mean that the reporting is in has no value to you, right? They still can produce very valuable reporting. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I see that from people at the trace, um, including yourself. Thank you. And I, you know, you know, we don't, we seek to not editorialize. We certainly don't run opinion pieces and, you know, our paramount concern, just like yours at the reload is just making sure that whatever we're putting out into the world, uh, stands up to scrutiny and is right. You know, even if you're, that, well, that's the goal. Just yeah, make factual sure not, accuracy. Yeah, sticking with yeah, just trying to trying to stick to facts. Or yeah, and and that doesn't mean that you and I or the reload and the trace are always going to agree on on uh, to points of, of of interest, right? And we're not going to agree. I think throughout this podcast, yeah, even um, this, right, right. But but it doesn't mean that I would completely write off everything you do uh, either. So uh, that same. I just you know, yeah, I just same, wanted to get same, that. Same at the top just to because you know 
I think it's important to, and I take this approach with a lot of outlets. Like I'll, I'll go on outlets that I don't agree with everyone who works there. Uh, there might be people I really don't like who work at certain outlet, different outlets that I've been on, but uh, there are other people that I enjoy their writing or I value their contribution. And, and so that, you know, that's the approach I try to take, you know, I try to focus on the output more than, uh, the brand or what have you. So, uh, all right, that's just my personal, yeah. my personal view of things. And so, and again, you know, it doesn't mean we always, I always agree with everything that, that the trace rights or, what, yeah, or whatever, course. but know, it's part of the, um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, to diverge. Yeah. 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 And I, we've, we've been on shows together before in the past as well. I think we did Megan mm-hmm. Kelly's show. Yeah. Another person yeah. I don't always agree with the things that she says or does, but right. I thought our episode was, we had a pretty good exchange. Yep. Yeah, um, but, uh, yeah, so I guess that brings us to today's story, the piece that you just wrote um, uh, for The Trace, and which was also published in The Atlantic. And um, and it deals with the the death, the suicide of somebody that I was good friends with. And that's where sort of the personal aspect of this comes in and why things I want to be upfront with the audience that this is going to be probably a bit different than our other podcasts, because I have a personal connection to what's going on. Um, I'd encourage people before we even start talking about the the story to go and read it for themselves, because I'm obviously very closely connected to the story. And so that can affect how you perceive it. Right. And it's just reality. And so people should read for themselves uh, the piece and make up their minds um, uh, and form their own perspective on it. But uh, uh, we'll get into some of the thoughts that I had, too. But why don't you just. Give us an overview in, in your own words here uh, of your piece. It's, it's a quite long investigative piece and has a lot of interviews, um, including one with with me <laughs> with quoted you. in there. But but uh, yeah, well, I just in your own words, how would you uh, summarize this this new story? Well, I think one thing that has routinely come up over the last like eight years as I started uh, focusing on guns as a subject. Uh, for reporting is just and, and gun death in particular is that most of it year in and year out is suicide, not homicide, which I think even now is still not widely understood. Hmm. Um, and that was something that was always in the back of my mind. And then in 2017, when, when Bob died by gun suicide, uh, I, I, I was personally quite shocked by it as I'm, you know, so many other people were, I, I mean, I, I, I would say I, very barely knew him when I mean, we exchanged like a couple of polite email exchanges. And I asked him a question or two for a story I wrote once. Um, but I encountered him a lot on social media, like everybody else did. He was sort of a voice that you couldn't really ignore. Uh, I was just sort of like a powerful, a powerful, a powerful writer uh, and someone that sort of commanded your attention. And, yeah, and, and for of, people, for yeah. people who don't know, uh, Bob, uh, you know, obviously we knew him. I knew him. I knew him really well. He was a good friend, yeah, he's a good friend, uh, and yeah. and cared a lot for him. And his death was was absolutely a surprise for for a lot of us. But um, uh, you know, a very bad surprise. And uh, but he was a he was a writer. He he ran uh, Bearing Arms, um, uh, which is which is part of Town Hall, it's a conservative you know publication uh, about firearms. And so he was a prominent. Uh, uh, a pro-gun writer, I guess, would be a, a good way of describing what he did, at least for a living. I mean, not who he was, but, yeah. but what he did. I think, uh, and so I, I had always been very, it seemed important, just as the years went on, to have to, to try as a reporter to have an understanding of what happened to Bob. If you were with the hope that it would provide a better understanding about the larger issue of suicide and, and who it was affecting and why. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that it would, and I don't, and I don't even know that he as a person is an, an example of that a, re- a representative example, certainly a number of people close to him, including in the story, including his widow, Christine, you know, doesn't view him that way. And, and I think it's important to think of everyone who, dies or just everyone as a human to think of them as an individual person and not to sort of treat them as a, a symbol or something like that. Um, 
but it seemed important to at least try because we had we just knowing that we had this ongoing issue of, of the majority of gun deaths being suicide and somehow that also being the aspect of gun death that gets ignored the most. What you know, what were we missing? What was I missing? What am I not understanding? You know, I, I, I didn't understand a lot um, when I went into the story. And then as I started to look into Bob, or started to look into what happened, I should say, and that began with first getting, uh, you know, the investigation that surrounded uh, the day that he passed um, down in North Carolina. It seemed important to also understand or give the, give, you know, the larger context to what extent, for example, the gun industry itself had been engaged in suicide prevention efforts, which it had been, you know, even before he died. And I felt like I had to like get a sense or get a really good sense of what, what those efforts consisted of, um, how, if it was even possible, one could determine the efficacy of those efforts did those efforts, were they at all potentially in conflict with what's required to be like a, a business that can continue to operate? Um, so it was just more of like an open-ended inquiry. And then the result was, you know, what's on the page, which is, you know, me doing my best. Um, I'm sure with shortcomings, as, as, as always happens when you produce a story, is just, you know, trying to tell the story of Bob, not just how he died, but also to some extent how he lived uh, to show my primary concern with him was to, you know, to the extent that I could humanize him as much as possible. That really mattered to me because I only had a one dimensional view of Bob before, you know, I started talking to people who knew him because I only saw him on social media. I mean, this is what the, you know, this is sort of what life is like now, unfortunately, you know, with the internet and whatnot. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to, so I wanted to understand it, if there was a trajectory even from, you know, his early life to where he wound up, you know, what did that look like? Is, you know, I just, that, that's just, I guess, sort of how you tell a story. And then at the other, at the same time, tell the story of just this topic of, research into the subject of gun suicide, which did sort of have an origin in the mid eighties and then what evolved from there. And, uh, those seemed like the, the two narratives that were in conversation with each other. And, um, yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I did my best to, to braid them together, uh, with the hope that there was something that could be learned. And, and, and again, you know, while I may have not been, fully successful my goal was to be as inclusive as possible to not and to not try to suggest that there was some kind of panacea or great solution hmm. for this problem or at least that's what i think i can say now I mean, that's what i think so much is like it's still even now even though it's been discussed a lot more it's still like a pretty taboo subject uh and i think if nothing else you know, my hope was that it would potentially start some kind of broader, bigger, or more intense conversation where people could think about, you know, I mean, again, you know, thinking about Bob and how no one really expected this, but just like, you know, that's, that seemed important for people to understand and to think about their own lives and, and what could be done, you know, for anyone as an individual, what, what, if any precautions one might need to take to protect themselves if they're ever at a place you know, where they're suffering or struggling. Yeah. Right. And, and, and obviously there's, there's uh, broader implications in the story um, you're about whether the uh, sort of voluntary approach that the industry prefers or that, you know, gun rights advocates prefer is, is um, effective compared to, uh, you know, what, um, you know, you, compared to the other side of the coin where it's more of a remove guns from the situation, uh, even if involuntarily, if, if necessary, I guess is, is sort of, there's a, um, a thread about that, uh, the debate. Um, yeah, I don't really know there. what's workable. 
to be honest with you. I, mm -hmm. and I, I, I wouldn't profess to really have, and you know, and I, again, it would be a shortcoming of the piece if I suggested that I did, because I, I really don't, I don't, I don't know what the right thing to do is. And I don't think anybody does. And you can also really understand, I mean, I don't want, also don't want to back away from this. I mean, one strain and all data, this is the caveat that all data is imperfect and especially the way people are characterized in data is imperfect and how it's collected is we're talking in terms of public health, but gun suicide seems at least according to the CDC data to particularly harm white men, you know, some, some mm -hmm. 80, roughly 80% year in and year out age yeah. 15 and over. And again, it's, you know, there's with the caveat that this is not perfect. Um, but also with the keen understanding and why it felt so important in the story to make sure that Bob's wife had the last word that for a lot of people, I mean, it's not, I, you know, gun ownership is, can be an organizing principle for your life. It, it, there's, it, it can be central to someone's identity and that shouldn't be looked down upon. I don't think it should be looked down upon. And also the danger that could come with stripping someone of that at their worst moment is also dangerous too. Yeah. And so I don't, which is again, which is why it seemed like perhaps the, the road was just the best road to take was trying to provide more awareness or make people potentially feel more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I do want to try to, uh, do, do our, do our best to focus on the larger conversation at play here. Cause I, you know, the, I, I, I do agree that the numbers, uh, that there are interesting patterns in numbers when you look at gun suicides, um, not just, uh, you know, uh, the age and, and race of, uh, and, and sex of the people involved, but also regionality is, is a big issue. Uh, when you look at suicide, um, you know, uh, that's that's actually one of the like I mean, California talks about having a low death gun death rate a lot. That's because their gun suicide rate is is quite low. Uh, their yeah. gun murder rate is pretty comparable to to their neighbors, um, right. you know, Arizona yeah. and and Nevada. But their gun suicide rate is much lower than it's great. Uh, yeah, than, than you know the uh, Midwestern states, rural areas of Midwestern states have very high gun suicide rates, and the demographics who live in those areas tend to be uh, white and people who own guns tend to be more male. Obviously this is changing yeah. uh, quite a bit in recent uh, years. We've talked a lot about that and it'll be interesting to True. see what kind of effect um, that has on these numbers. And uh, I mean, that's almost morbid to say that, but like uh, whether this is remains um, as racialized a, a phenomenon as it's been um, or whether that's just a result of how gun ownership has spread out in the country um across demographics to this point but um yeah i mean it's still hard for me to talk about it at all because of course yes you know it, it's it's difficult I, and because I, I totally understand the how, why this piece comes about right it, it, someone was going to write a piece like this at some point because bob was prominent um gun writer who who used a firearm to end his life and uh and you know that that um is something that gets people's attention. People get interested in, in that contradiction, right? He was a pro gun person and, um, and, and it was involved in the way he, he ended his life. And that's, I totally understand people's interest in that. Um, but it's hard for me as somebody who knew him really well and who was there at a lot of these moments in the story. Um, <clears throat> not all of them, of course, I didn't know him his whole life. I just, um, we, we became friends, uh, for, you know, through writing, but, um, yeah. And it's just sucks because I understand the, I'm a writer. I write about politics. I write about guns. I write about, uh, all, all the things implicating the story. And so I totally understand why this story was going to be written at some, at some point. Um, but it's also for me, it's just awful, uh, to um to talk about bob in, in in this context just because um you know i just wish he was still here you know just like i think everyone who in that story that you talked to who knew him um 
And, you know, there's plenty, you know, and I, and I know he was a brash guy. He was, he was, a, he was a bomb thrower. He had a, he had that style to his writing and that, that comes through in the piece too. Um, and I thought you did a pretty good job of capturing his personal side as well. And some of the background of how he became interested in firearms and got into this stuff. Uh, in the first place, I thought you did a, a an honorable job of that. Um, you know, and, and I didn't always agree with Bob on everything, but it's like, I'm not going to come out and talk about things that I didn't like or did like, or, you know, it's just, uh, he, Bob is gone and it sucks. And that's, that's what, that's, that's what I think about. And it makes me kind of sad and rambly as you can tell probably. Well, um, you but, were, I remember when we were talking, you had said rightly, you know, you were like, in some ways his death was the least interesting thing about him. Anyways. I mean, he yeah. was a, that, that, that was the last thing that happened to him. He had a whole right. entire life before that. And I want to just, you know, one of the things that I deeply admired about Bob that I, I, I sensed when he was alive, but that I really saw is I, not just from talking to people who knew him well, but also from reading his work was that he really did strive for moral consistency in his writing, which is just untrue for a lot of people, no matter where they stand on the political spectrum. Yeah. He was not afraid to take a position that would be uncomfortable to people who generally agree with him on things, you know, and that was, mm -hmm. he was someone, for example, who is not in favor of abortion, but he also found it hideous to advocate for the death of abortion doctors Right. to advocate for the death of Barack Obama, even though he didn't like Barack Obama as a president, uh, you know, took issue with the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. Like he was not. It, every person is complicated and contains multitudes. And I'll say also, and I, I it reinforced some of this, you know, Jen Jakes, who's his good friend and talked about a little bit. It was just briefly quoted as talking about the concerns that certain gun owners have with being, Maligned uh, by gun rights or by, excuse me, by, by gun, you know, GV, gun violence prevention advocates by, you know, being unfairly targeted or, or um, shamed, uh, you know, for their position. And, and it, you know, I will say, I, I, well, it wasn't a ton of it. I was quite disturbed to see people, some people anyway, comment on the posts, Twitter, you know, posts of the story basically saying like good riddance, you know, with respect yeah. to, and I, um, a lot of that happened at the time too, yeah. uh, immediately as it happened is, and look that, that, that happens in, there's a, a, a general societal issue we have with our politics right now, right. but, but it absolutely did happen when Bob died and it was horrendous. And so you, and, and you get people on, uh, the left who are, or whatever you want to, the people who didn't like Bob's gun politics saying, oh, you, you know, so, this is proof of why we're right about the issue. Look at this guy. Uh, and then you have people uh, who, who did agree with him. Some are probably thinking, oh, why did you use a gun instead of something else? It's just like, and that's, that's, that's where, yeah, the least interesting to me thing to me that's about Bob's death is how he, point scoring. he yeah, committed, you know, it's just, the fact that he did it's 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 very hard for anyone left behind in a situation like that um uh and, and the the politicization of it it just makes it much harder you know to me bob uh you know i read your read the story and and what i remember personally that has the most personal effect is just this it's an irrational thought and i understand that and 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 uh i think you capture some of this with some of the other people that you talk to about Bob. Um, but, you know, when Bob was struggling with work, with the stress of work, which, you know, is something that anyone who works in this industry can understand the, the workload that gets put on you um, at times. Um, but, you know, when he was struggling with that, they, I, I remember he offered me a job um, uh, to come and work with him, him and Jen. And it didn't, it wasn't something that made sense for me at the time. Um, but it's something where, you know, looking back and part of the stress was you, you think to yourself, oh, if I if I had taken that job, maybe he was wouldn't have done this or whatever. And, and I'm sure everybody who knew him has that sort of thought that goes through head, even though it's not true. Right. It's, it's almost certainly not the case. That's, you know, really that's not hard. really how suicide works. No, right. No, it's not. And, and it's 
and it, it, it's also, you know, it's also just worth emphasizing for listeners to make clear that this is something that, that I know and that, and that should be conveyed as much as possible, which is owning a firearm, of course, does not make someone suicidal or more suicidal or inclined to suicide. It just purely, it's just, it, 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 it comes into play just in, in terms of its efficiency. When if, if somebody's going to in that impulsive window, like yeah. Bob was in that window, it's just, you know, what's, yeah, uh, and, and honestly, that's a fair yeah. point. On uh, like, uh, uh, firearms are indisputably the most effective means of uh, carrying out um, a, su- a suicide attempt. That's just reality. Um, now, how <clears throat> obviously there's much bigger debate over how to, how to mitigate how to address that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, I don't have any. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, the, one, the other thing I, I just wanted to get in there, which is also important to say, and which I hope especially that Christine, his really lovely widow, who's so you know, thoughtful, hope it was clear, you know, how she was conveying this. And I think you had said something to me that was, we, you know, at one point it was in the piece and just it, it kind of, unfortunately, stories get whittled down. But I, you had said a very profound thing to me also that I thought about a lot. Which is just, you know, you, you would ask me in our, one of our conversations, well, like, what's the solution? You know, should Bob have never owned firearms? He would have been a different person. Christine made the, and that is true philosophically and also like existentially. I mean, it's, if, if he had never owned them, maybe his life would have been much harder. Like, that's a whole other, I got, it's just, if there, I don't, I'm not saying, you know, his, Lots of different things brought meaning to his life, his family, his friends, the things that bring meaning to all of our lives. But, but there, it, with the absence of that, and I, this is what I want to, I care about trying to be as fair to as possible. That could have, that, I mean, without that aspect of his life, he could have had that, he could have been worse off. I mean, it ended up, it ended up being the case that he died by gun suicide. But at the same time, also, if he had never had, if, the, if those things had not been part of his life, all these people that came into his life that he cared so much about wouldn't have been there. Like, it just, it's really yeah, very complicated. It is. And and uh, I think everyone would agree at, that in the moment when um, <clears throat> when he did this, he would have it, it would have been positive if he hadn't had access to firearms at that moment. Right. But the right. question then becomes, how, OK. Well, how do you get to that point? And especially in a situation with somebody like Bob or some, just say like myself or something like that. I'm, I'm not, I don't have uh, any concerns to this point. Uh, I don't have any suicidal ideation um, and, and haven't. But, uh, uh, you know, if somebody in a position where guns are not just a tremendous part of their uh, life and identity, really, um, but... Uh, also part of their living, how they make a living, right? Yep. How how do you uh, separate someone like that from their firearms? Um, whether you think that doing it voluntarily or, I mean, I, I think voluntarily makes no sense in that situation because the person would be much more likely to actually reach out for help. Um, it doesn't always happen, as you mentioned, as you showed several times, or even when they do, like with the big problem with Bob, if you read the, you know, and your story, I think lays this out pretty well. Like, you know, it starts with a quote about nobody saw this coming. And I think that's meant like at the exact moment it happened, because right. obviously later in the story, there were signs that Bob was struggling and that, and people did try to help him. He he yeah. was getting therapy. He was, he did. Yeah. Yeah. but that's Tried medication. Yeah, yeah. That's the hard thing about suicidal ideation is that, um, and, and he stopped taking the medication because it made, made him feel worse, which is, I think, a common issue with antidepressants right um that's yep. why they they have the warning risks for suicide when you start taking an antidepressant because there's sort of a a moment where you're coming up this is my understanding of i'm not an expert on on this yeah, topic they, they um, yeah. and there are really good resources out there for for anyone who is struggling with this uh, like the suicide prevention hotline and i would encourage people to look into that if, if they are feeling uh, any sort of suicidal ideation of course since especially since we're talking about it openly on the show, but, um, <clears throat> but you know, that, that can be a, a symptom. You're coming out of a, a depressive state. Um, cause they can often make you 
uh, lethargic. So you're not actually able to go through with yeah. an act until you come up a little bit from that point. But the, you know, the main struggle is just that these things can come on suddenly, yeah. um, that they're not, it's not necessarily, uh, that, I don't know, you, you can be getting help and then you can hit a point and yeah. you're not thinking clearly about the, about what you're, what's going on. And, uh, and that's when you're susceptible to, to doing this, even if somebody, even if people are trying to help you, even I mean, if people it, noticed. So it, it's this, hard. Yeah, you're it's right. Hard. This is a sort of crappy analogy, but it's just one that I've thought of. And again, it's not great, but it's just the same. Um, it's like people who, if you know who, who were smokers and you quit, uh, but you have the nicotine urge, but it's a really, it's a timed urge and it's just, if you can get out of the window, but you don't know when the, you don't yeah. know when the urge is going to come on. You know right. what I mean? Like you can be good for mostly you have the urge and then the urge is really overwhelming and strong, but it is pretty, it, it is fixed more or less. Right. And if you can get through like that four minute window or something, then you're, you're, oh, you're not going to, you're not going to feel the need to go buy like a pack of cigarettes. And it's somewhere it's just like, yeah, you don't, you don't really know when it's going to come on. And, um, and just when yeah. you're in that danger zone, that window, it's just, yeah, what's, what is, what is it that you have access to? Yeah. And that's, um, yeah. And having yes. access to a yeah. farm is, uh, you know, obviously, um, makes a suicide attempt more likely to succeed, unfortunately. And, and I and think the people need to be realistic about, about that. that. Yeah, yeah, it's not, you know, that's not something that, to be clear, I mean, is a, you know, is quite a bold stance for an industry that obviously, you know, the, the, the function of any business is to survive as a business. That means, yeah. so it's just, you know, for them to come out and very specifically, you know, say that, you know, that there's like the suicide tends to be impulsive, that uh, ideation tends to be you know, like a fixed time period. And then if you can just in that moment or that, 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 that I should say it's more than a moment, but in that, in that brief period where you're feeling that way, if whatever your preferred method is, whether it's whatever it is. Yeah. And obviously removing a gun is not a guaranteed solution. to Right. Right. There's, they know that there's not a ton of subs like that. There's ultimately more often they're not than not. If you're, for example, if you wanted to go to a bridge and you found yourself blocked more often than not, people go home and then they don't, do something else not all yeah. i mean it's not not always the case right but it's uh it's extremely difficult i mean i you know again i it's i, I have found some you know we again space is limited and in some ways i think you know more about this than me but i've i certainly found some hope in in some of the different things that veterans do yeah there's sort of a notion among and i, th- I think is smart you know the notion among veterans the sort of brotherhood and sisterhood Mm-hmm. of watching out for each other and knowing that when you come back from a tour of duty, like people are, are prone to having like a tough time and that you should be, you know, the, just like when you're, you know, the notion of being in a foxhole and watching your, your, your partner six or whatever, you know, whatever people yeah. say, the culture of that I think is really beneficial to prevention. I mean, it, yeah. it had a just a question of how you sort of. Right. And and the gun and the commu- the gun owning community has taken some steps down this path to trying yeah. to uh, instill a a, a, a societal uh, uh, view like that like comes from the military. There there are things like hold my gun or walk the talk America that aren't right. necessarily um, industry driven things. They may be supported by the industry in some ways, but they're not. You know, the NSSF has its own program with a national suicide. Yeah. Uh, prevention group uh, that you talk about in the piece and there's some critiques of it that you that you mentioned but uh, you know I uh, one of the thing I do want to get into a little bit of some of the issues that I have with the piece or like some of the sure. critiques at least because right, yeah. we're having a very good conversation here and yeah, and I do appreciate that and um, it is it is hard to condense all of this into a, a written piece um, especially you know with the editing process and I'm sure it was a much longer piece when you first submitted it and that's just the nature of of news publishing, but, but, um, you know, I don't know. And, and again, this is where, you know, I'm close to this story. So maybe people have a different perspective when they read it. But, um, one of the issues that I had was with the, the cost benefit analysis analysis that's pre- presented in the piece seems, uh, almost like 
to me, there was a, and it's not that you say any of this explicitly, so people should understand that. But to me, there was, um, it comes off a bit as like people who own people who own these guns. And obviously Bob is the main example of this, um, are, you know, kind of paranoid white guys and they, they don't have really good reason, uh, or like they, you explain some of the reasoning of you know, wanting to protect yourself and your family and so forth. But, uh, you undercut a lot of that with, with arguments from, uh, you know, different ac academic sources. Um, and, and that was one of the issues that I have with it. Like there's, for instance, the, you talk about the study that, um, that claims they're, you know, it's, you're more likely to kill yourself with a firearm than you are to kill someone in self-defense, which is probably true. But the, of course, one of the big caveats or criticisms of that is that it's very similar to, you know, when, when I had, um, the head of gun violence archive on the show and their defensive gun use stats rely on uh, news reports. Um, uh, and, and the problem with that is you're only going to get a, a very small subset, it seems uh, logically to uh, of actual defensive gun uses. If you're only relying on news reports or police reports, because most people who use a gun in self-defense, uh, are probably not reporting that and probably not even firing a shot. At least that's what surveys say. Um, and, and so you have this massive gap. And I know that, and obviously there's a whole debate over the right way to, to measure defensive gun uses, but uh, at least one way that has been prominent and uh, has its own strengths is survey-based estimates, which put defensive gun use in the millions per year, whereas suicides, even though they are rising, are, are in the tens, tens of thousands per year. And so, you know, if you look at it from that point of view, the risk benefit analysis becomes a lot more clear, even if you don't, you know, even if you personally wouldn't uh, take that calculation. Does that make sense? Like, I just feel like it, it was a bit undersold in terms of why well, someone would own a gun. It makes people seem a little paranoid. You know, they talk about the what neighborhoods the demographic of gun owner you know these uh kinds of gun owners who are susceptible to suicide live in their safer neighborhoods so why are they but they're more concerned yeah, yeah you know I, I mean know. no it's i think that that's uh legitimate criticism i mean i tried i think i guess to take it in parts i think the the study the first study you're referring to was the, like the sort of foundational mm -hmm. linkage study or study that linked made any kind of correlation between ownership and suicide was, you know, sort of famous Dr. Arthur Kellerman who did two yeah, different. Very controversial, and, obviously. And we don't have to get and, into the, all yeah, of that. And, problem, and for me, that was more just, I needed the, the story, like that narrative needed to start somewhere and sort sure. of that. And that, and, the, and that sort that was sort of the beginning of it. I, um, I mean, his research is a little, I mean, if you went back and you looked at his research, I mean, it's not, well, it's not definitive. I don't know that you can do anything definitive, honestly. Sure. But but you know, and there's you know, problems with survey-based defensive gun yes. uses, as we talked about on the podcast right. in the past. But right. So I mean, his you know, and his so all the caveats applying with surveys. Yeah. yeah I mean, I I deliberately tried to some extent to to not get into defensive gun use research specifically, just because there's just so many contradictions built into it. And I, and I don't, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to be the arbiter of truth on that because yeah. it's true. I mean, I can't, I can't knock down. I mean, the, you know, the surveys like the, 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 the telephone survey, for example, telephone surveys, as opposed to like what's done through the federal government. Yeah. Obviously that gets a lot of criticism, you know, for overestimates and how that might work and you sure. know, telescoping phenomenons. And I, I'm not actually to be clear weighing in on this, but your point's well taken. You know, I, I what I tried to do, to, and again, it, it just may have not been enough, was to just, in that regard, rely on the NSSF's own research or one survey that I had, you know, I, yeah. I purchased, you know, which was like a 2015 survey that looked at how people defined where they live. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was not conclusive, uh, but informative, which was just to say that in, in that survey, it found that people of color were more likely to say that they lived in dangerous neighborhoods, according to the NSSFs. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That's just what it said. And yeah. then I thought... And obviously the demographic shift over the last yeah. decade or so is... Yes, totally. Affect and, that and, too, probably. 
And then it's like, you know, you can point to, and again, this doesn't give you the nearly the whole picture either. It's just more like a concrete and less perception based, which is just like who, yeah. you know, white. Okay. So white men are more likely to be victims of gun, some, gun homicide, or excuse me, gun suicide. People mm-hmm. of color are more likely to be victims of gun homicide. And that's, right. I mean, that's the numbers, you know, are as they are. Um, the point is well taken. I don't even really have a great answer for it. I mean, I think it's just, I, I mean, what I was hoping to do, uh, and it may be a shortcoming of the piece, and what was in the back of my mind was something that a fairly, a, a quite smart, sharp sociologist who had written a book about gun carrying had talked to me about named Angela Stroud, who was a gun owner herself, and she, and she carries, which is that yeah. she had told me, you know, some point there is this understanding that she had encountered it a lot of people over the course of her ethnographic research, gun owners who moved from the perspective that there was nothing to lose by owning a firearm. And even if the scenario of a defensive situation was unlikely, better to be prepared than not, which is legitimate logic. Her mm-hmm. point was that it's not a no risk situation for you. And I, sure. I guess that was sort of what I was, you know, if, if nothing else, because like I said, I don't, I don't, as a, as a reporter, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in imposing solutions. I just, you know, it's not, I don't think that that's appropriate no matter what I really think. Hmm. But I do think it's, that was sort of what I was trying to get at was that this is okay. not a no risk scenario, you know what I mean? Yeah. That sort of thing and, about. I, and I think uh, gun owners would, would agree that owning a gun is not, no risk right they're they're yeah, they're, yeah. Uh, they're dangerous like a like you know a lot of uh, different things can you yeah, do. your the, car the, is dangerous there's sure. there's risk yeah, in your car or power tools things like that obviously different kinds of risks different levels of risk but yeah but um uh yeah i mean i just and and again to be fair like it's not as though you wrote in the piece oh it's dumb to own a gun because of the xyz it's more you know it, it just reading it that was the I had hoped that there would be more of the justification or like some, some more statistics you. of why people feel this is a, a worthwhile trade-off, you know? Well, um, and I also tried to point out, I mean, it did, we did say quite explicitly that while, while Bob wound up in a quite a safe neighborhood in North Carolina, he did live yeah. with his family for a long time in, you did, in Newburgh, you did. New York, which is a very unsafe place. I mean, right. the most, for a time when he was there, the most unsafe place in the entire state. Yeah. Yeah, you you did put that in. That is fair. Like, I I don't think that the story of Bob is totally uh, misrepresented. I don't think it's misrepresented, and I don't think that it's uh, too little about Bob. So, like I said earlier, you know, I I get it. I understand that that you did a a pretty good job of being fair to him, um, and 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 getting the perspective of his wife and his friends um, to to help explain who he was beyond, you know, what are his public writings? Cause that's only one aspect of who he was, but yeah, I mean, that was my main critique is like, uh, when I, when I read it, I, I feel like you could come away with the perspective that it's illogical of people like, and Bob is the main example of this kind of person in the story, you know, um, to, own guns and it's just an over paranoid thing, especially for this kind of like this demographic of, uh, you know, white guys. And I understand that probably wasn't your intention. I just, that was the thing that, that I was most bothered by, I guess, for reading well, the piece. I could really understand that. I mean, it is, I think it's possible. Is it, and I, I, I so just sort of follow me here because this is where things get, it, it may be the case for some portion of people that it, it could be illogical, but at the same time, again, bad analogy, but it's just the one that comes to mind that I'm not saying that these things are comparable, but you, there's, you know, the famous documentary that came out a few years ago called free solo, you know, about the, the climber who climbs mm-hmm. mountains without him. He's an amazing climber. He sure. He yeah. accomplishes these incredible feats. And he talks to a lot of different, um, you know, he does a lot of corporate speeches, that kind of thing as well. And a friend of mine actually came to my friend's company. So he was talking to me about this and it came to my mind because the, um, one of the things that he talks about is he says, you know, obviously climbing without a harness uh, and scaling these incredibly 
dangerous mounts would, would, would first of all kill most of us, but he knows he takes every precaution imaginable, mm -hmm. does so much surveying and all that stuff beforehand, does everything he can to mitigate every risk, but also knows in his mind that there's only so much you can do. And at some point he believes that he probably will die climbing a mountain is usually what happens to people who free. So, and again, I'm not, this is not meant to be a direct. Yeah. Cause obviously it's not everybody who owns a yes, gun is going to die no, from it. Right. Certainly not. And it's not, I don't mean that it, I don't mean to be at all. What was more interesting to me was that he said, but the option of not climbing would be death for me. That would mm. be like, I, I am not alive if I'm not climbing. So it's not like that, that eventual possible conclusion to my life is irrelevant yeah. to me. And, yeah. and so I thought, okay, well, maybe it's true based on the data. And I, again, the, the, the piece may have not fully successfully done this. And I don't think anything I write is above criticism by any means. It may be the case. And, and some people may really adamantly disagree with this or hate that I'm saying it, that on paper, it's not the best. It may not be the best decision rationally or in terms of just risk benefit, like what you're going to encounter. It may be the case that, you know, you're, you're highly unlikely to encounter like a, a violent situation where you would need to defend yourself with fire. Maybe that's true. Um, and it, you know, I'm thinking again about the NSSF survey where people, how they view where they live. And yeah. at the same time, you have to allow, and I'm trying to also allow and other people need to allow that. And as was the case, you know, with someone like Bob, what this brought to his life was found. Like it was, it was a key aspect of his living. Yeah. And you can't really, you can't, you just, it's not possible to disregard that. And so similarly, it's like if, if Alex handled the climber is saying, you take climbing away from me because it's possible I may die from this. I'm dead. I'm dead already. And I'm, again, I'm not saying again, this is not, this is by any means not a perfect comparison. I, it, it's, it's even, it's not, it doesn't really necessarily have to be rational. Yeah. Even if it's, again, and we, one may disagree with that premise, but it's not, um, which is a long way of saying, this is why I think it's so complicated and why I think if nothing else, the best thing to do is to make it like something that really is openly and frequently discussed. So people, yeah. you know, and I, and I don't, and I don't know what that you know necessarily leads to. But I think the more light that's on it, the better. You know what I mean? In terms of doesn't it without advocating for some, you know, I, I don't, I, well, I, I'm not going to advocate for a solution. So I, I, sure. I don't. Yeah. And, and, and obviously it's a, it's a personal risk benefit analysis when it comes to gun ownership because like, yeah. like you were, I think you were trying to articulate there, like uh, it, it is going to be whether or not you're going to need deadly force to protect yourself is going to be dependent on all sorts of different things in your life and whether or not you're as susceptible to suicidal ideation as somebody else will also be an individual uh, calculation, honestly, yeah. like that's just, that's just, um, yep. that's just reality. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult, I, you know, and, and I just, um, I just, like to try and give people as much of the uh, benefit of the doubt in these situations and try to paint a, the, the picture of like, here's why a lot of people consider this to be a good calculation or why they think that yeah. they're on the right well, side of that calculation. And that was that. So, um, yeah. And look, you did put it, it wasn't like there was nothing about that in there. Um, that was my major critique with there, you know, and, and look, it's a very long piece too. Uh, so, so there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in there and I think people should go and read it for themselves. Um, uh, and maybe we could have you on again in the future as well. Cause I thought this was a good conversation. I just a bit different from what we normally do. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. But, yeah. but I thought it was constructive and I really appreciate you like taking the time to go through these things and to be open to, to, you know, responding to, to some of the critiques I had or just talking through some of the, no, 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 the I mean, story. They're very astute and smart observations. And I, as I always say, I mean, I have a huge amount of respect for you and the work you do. Um, uh, and I respect you, you as well. I mean, there's one, I should say there's one aspect of the story that I thought, and this is where, I, where I'm where i trying to get at the point of like, why just in general light is good. You know, it's the, mm -hmm. the you know, the, I mean, I, I don't know what the National Rifle Association should do, just to be clear, but 
Yeah. You know, and over the course of reporting, they discovered over the last 10 years that at least, you know, four different employees there had, had died by gun suicide. And that's not good. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, it's, I, I can't make a measurement, to, you know, in terms of like what's statistically what you'd expect or I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't that was really one of the know. things I was wondering, like this a fairly large organization. Um, it's, I mean, I it's would, hard. Yeah. you would want them to do as much as they can to, right. to try and prevent that. But I do. Yeah. Like you said, I don't know exactly. Maybe they should have more of an internal program. I, I don't well, know. But. And that may be true. And I, I don't really know. It just more. And I, 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 so I didn't mean this as something that like they're on the hook to necessarily do something, but also at the same, and, and, and because also it, it's common, you know, if someone dies by suicide, that's not typically public information in general. It's not mm. specific to you know, yeah. the organization, you know, or right. that organization or any, but um, it at least raised the question for me, you know, given your role in this debate, do you have a unique responsibility? I don't know. I'm just asking, do you have, and, and in that case, what is it? What should you, what, what would be the, you know, and I, and the, you know, you can think, I guess I'm trying to set up some kind of comparison between them and what the NSSF has done, which is to be quite open, you know, to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I think it's a valid question, but I don't, there. that I also don't have like totally clear answers for either. I mean, that's kind of maybe something NRA members themselves, right. Uh, uh, right. Insofar as they can control what the uh, the organization does, um, uh, should should think. Of, I, I do think it should be a conversation. That, that's right. you know what, what should minimum. what responsibility does the gun owning community have to try and prevent gun suicides? I would think that it's that there certainly is some. Um, you know, as gun owners, especially, you know, obviously, I think your the main responsibility rests with the um, not even society at large, but just people's friends and family and and that's where i think the, most of the the hurt of it falls too after the fact too um as well but uh, but it's obviously not easy for anyone even even in a situation like bobs where people did try to yeah they did try yep. to help him. you know he he did and he and he tried to get help you know it wasn't yep. uh, that's and that's just one of the terrible natures of this of the of, of suicide it's just it's not always some black and white thing that there's some easy answer for it. it just isn't isn't that way um but but i do agree with you for sure on on the uh that that it's something deserves a lot of conversation and 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 coverage and even if it's difficult to talk about and it's personal uh like this is for me uh it's still something that that we need to engage in yeah and you know i i also wanted people to know who were you know, obviously, the story up here in the Atlantic, you know, I, I work for the Trace. So there's, you know, it's the more people who are inclined to view the gun debate one way are going to read this story, which is, say, people, I think, who are more in favor of gun control, you know, that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, so part of it, I mean, it, it felt, and again, I don't, I don't know to what extent I fully succeeded. You know, it's sort of hard to, to tough needle thread, but I, you know, I, especially based on some of the reaction, it's like, it, it, it seems extremely important to continually remind people that, that everybody is a human mm. who uh, has people who love them and care about them and they care and love about people. And, you know, one thing that always came up with Bob is it just, if, you know, it's a bit about, there's a, you know, main road that was close by his house and there were frequently like car accidents out there. If he heard one, he was always the first guy who ran out. I, you know, I don't, I don't think if you needed help, he would not have cared what it wasn't. It was it, that it's not something that would have ever figured in his calculation. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, um, I think every person, you know, his close friend, Jen, Jake's you, and most people that I come across genuinely care about society and about people. And, you know, there's this sort of general disagreement on, I realize that, you know, a lot, everyone I spoke to wants to help the most people possible yeah. and values human life. And we may disagree about how we get to the place of how we can help human life in the you know best way possible, but it just, I just want people to remember that. I think it just really does everyone such a terrible disservice to, you know, to the instinct to dehumanize and to, mm -hmm. and to you mm -hmm. know, it's just really, 
it sucks. I, I feel, and I've, I guess I just, I don't, I don't know, I'm sort of rambling now. I just felt it more with this story than I have with other ones. Uh, and yeah. I'm very grateful to the people who I think took, you know, whether such as yourself or others who I understand have real concerns about potentially talking to someone like me and that sort of thing. And I, you know, it's, um, I just can't articulate enough that I've, I've always, you know, I've just, the, the kindness that I've encountered, um, despite disagreements and, and whatnot, cannot be understated. Uh, just, uh, you know, there's a lot of good people out there, and I, I, I would encourage everyone to remember that. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. You know, there's, there's, there, there are these you know, very principled disagreements that people have on these subjects, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important to one understand where the where they're coming from, but also to talk to each other and to try and be uh, human, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's that is something that we've lost a lot of, I think, in our politics. Um, uh, yep. As of late, uh, you know, for 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 a good while now, unfortunately, and um, and so yeah, I appreciate you. That that's why I like uh, having people on from other outlets from other that have different editorial perspectives than we do. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and I really appreciate that you came on and we're, we're willing to have a candid conversation like this. I think it, I think it was valuable. I'm really grateful that you had me on, uh, grateful for your work, grateful for your help on the story. Um, and yeah, I look at any, you know, more than happy to talk to you anytime. Absolutely. Um, and so if people want to read the story for themselves, what's the best way to do that? Either you can get it from the on the it's either on the Atlantic's website or the Traces website. Uh, I think the there may be a paywall on the Atlantic, depending on how often you go there. The, the Traces version is free, so either or, whichever one you know is easiest. I've I've put a couple gift links out, so if you can, if you want to look at the Atlantic version, if that's your preference, you can find okay. it on my on my X or Twitter, whatever whatever you're supposed to call it. <laughs> if you really know, uh, but either place you can see it either place, and don't if you want to reach out and it's just like you, you know if you have concerns, criticisms, I don't you know I don't mind, uh, you know I can only speak for myself. I come in peace. I I'm always open to any kind of constructive feedback. All right. Well, we we appreciate you doing this, uh, and we're gonna head over to our news update now. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined as always by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. How are we doing this week, Steve? I'm doing all right. Um, you know, the main interview was pretty long, so we should probably just jump right into the news. So what do we got? Certainly. Yeah. So a couple quick headlines from the newsletter, uh, both uh, interestingly about red flag laws. So first off, we have an effort uh, by gun rights advocates in Michigan to place a referendum on the ballot uh, to repeal the recently passed red flag law in the state. Um, so it'll be an interesting bellwether of political support for red flag laws. If that you know gets on the ballot, we'll mm -hmm. get a chance to actually see how people want to uh, support those laws. And then the other, I think, interesting political bellwether comes from Kentucky, where we have another instance of a Republican lawmaker introducing a, a form of red flag law. They're not, once again, they're not calling it a red flag law, but it's essentially that. Um, so probably not going to pass, as we've written about before. Uh, red flag laws seem to have hit their political ceiling when it comes to red states, but still, I think, noteworthy that Republicans in some of these states are trying. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly noteworthy. I think that's interesting. And, and yeah, as you said, it should be, uh, there should be in good indicators for where support for red flag laws are at, um, depending on how far along those efforts get. Um, and then, of course, we have, we have a couple of big stories this week, uh, right before Right before the holidays. Um, what's the first one? You wrote, you wrote about the first one. That's right. So we got our first big ruling on California's so-called Bruin response bill. Uh, SB2 was their sort of long-awaited effort because it failed originally, but they finally got one passed and it was supposed to take effect January 1st. But before that could happen, we have a federal judge that enjoined about 17 uh, sensitive locations that were deemed off limits to even licensed carry. Um, so those include things like parks, uh, you know, recreation centers, uh, parking lots. It's basically all, parking all lots. of them, right? Almost all of them. They, they left off the, the gun rights advocates that challenged that law, left off some of like the less controversial ones like polling places, schools, for example, that mm. sort of yeah, directly absolutely. referenced by the Supreme Court. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And once again, the so-called vampire rule. So this is a unanimous in almost every one of these challenges, the so-called vampire rule where uh, these states were making it so any publicly accessible private business, so like a store, for example, was presumptively off limits to carry unless a store owner put up a sign saying you you can come carry in my business. So that was also yeah, flipping, enjoying. flipping things on their heads from how they've been traditionally. Right. That's exactly right. And, you know, there's been some split rulings on these from all the other states that have passed so-called Bruin response bills. But that particular provision, I think, is interesting, has gone down in every single lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that's a big win for gun rights advocates out in, in California. I mean, that's this has got to be the first ruling that they've won on basically every point. In fact, I think the judge went even further than than some of the claims uh, and ex expanded this ruling to parking lots of some of the sensitive locations. Um, even even though plaintiffs hadn't challenged that aspect of the law, so it's, it's pretty interesting. It was a pretty resounding victory for. For the gun rights advocates in this case, um, obviously it's a district level court, so we would expect there will be appeals to this. Um, yeah, Bonta but, has already announced an appeal, so it didn't yeah. take long for him to. But but it's it is right. noteworthy that the judge did not issue a stay, which is some sort of common in these rulings. So technically, mm -hmm. that law is blocked. Now it hasn't taken effect yeah, and yet. Before, so. before it went into effect, too, which is another right. big aspect of it. Certainly. Uh, but we'll see what the Ninth Circuit does. There's probably a, at least a decent likelihood that the Ninth Circuit will stay that ruling pending appeal. Um, but at least for the time being, it's a big win for gun rights advocates. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the final big story that we're going to talk about is actually one you broke about uh, a forthcoming, potentially forthcoming rule from the Commerce Department uh, over guns, if you want to tell us what your reporting found. Yeah, the, <clears throat> this is kind of our, our big story of the week, uh, an exclusive for us, where we uh, published a leaked draft of a proposed rule from the Commerce Department, which kind of sounds dry, I'm sure, but <clears throat> has pretty big implications for the uh, gun industry, as well as for foreign gun buyers in countries, including Israel and Ukraine, who have obviously seen a huge uptick in civilian demand for firearms uh, since they were both invaded, right, uh, since since the October 7th terrorist attacks in Israel, and then obviously the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, you've seen both those countries, <clears throat> excuse me, loosen their gun laws. And also uh, you've seen civilians go out and buy a lot more guns than normal in those places. And I'm sure a good number of those are American made guns. Um, and this rule that we published, this the draft, would impose a number <clears throat> of serious restrictions on the export of American firearms uh, if it were to become uh, uh, official, right? Like it would still, this is a draft, so has, they haven't finalized this rule yet. And the Commerce Department emphasized that when I spoke to them, uh, as well as the, put an emphasis on the idea that maybe Israel and Ukraine would be exempted from this final rule. Some of the some countries, there's 40 countries that are exempted from these new rules under this proposal. Um, and in addition to those 40 countries, Israel and Ukraine are exempted from what the administration has already done right now, which is to put a pause on on all firearms exports to uh, countries outside of that block. Um, for 90 days, and that's set to expire next month. And it seems like this proposal is going to be what they put in place of that kind of temporary total uh, ban on exports or export licenses. And so uh, the big new restriction in there is uh, it's actually kind of a, a pseudo gun registry that would be regulated by the Department of Congress, the U.S. Department of Congress, and administered effectively by American gun companies on foreign gun buyers, because what's required under this proposal is that uh, anyone who wants to export an American-made firearm to another country affected by these rules uh, has to first get a purchase order for each each gun, uh, an individual, you know, purchase order and then accompanying that has to be the end user, the buyers, uh, the, the actual person who's going to buy the gun at the end, not, not the distributor or wholesaler or anything like that in a foreign country, but the actual end buyer, um, they have to get their passport 
or national ID. So I, they'd be collecting all of this um, identification documentation on foreign nationals and, and keeping it uh, as a in the <laughs> in American gun companies or, or by the American government. And that's kind of a, a fascinating idea um, for sure. It's sort of a foreign gun registry for that's run by Americans. Um, when, of course, in the United States, we don't have a, a national gun registry. The, the, the federal government does not run a registry of people who buy guns here. But uh, that seems to be what they want to do of people for people who buy guns in other countries. Um, right. And, you know, so some of these now a lot of a lot of the you know, NATO countries are exempt from this. There's a, something called the Wassenaar Agreement that is a tr arms trade uh, deal that includes a lot of just 40. As I mentioned earlier, there's 40 countries in there. And actually, Ukraine is in that agreement, too. But for whatever reason, they're not considered the same as the other countries for these regulations. Um, and so they they would be subject to the regulations under this proposal. So Israel's not in the Wassenaar Agreement. Uh, so they'd be subject. There's also countries like Brazil, which has um, also seen some efforts to liberalize its gun laws. Uh, I believe Argentina would be another one that's currently undergoing the same process of liberalization. And, uh, you know, uh, the Commerce Department, as I said, they they say this is not finalized, that they're still talking with their Israeli and Ukrainian counterparts. But um, it would have a pretty significant impact uh, from the experts that I spoke with and as well as from what the industry told me. Uh, and they, they view it as a sort of uh, assault weapons export ban because it mainly applies to um, semi-automatic center fire guns that have one or more banned features, which include things like pistol grips or um, telescoping stocks, things of like that. So something you'd find in a traditional American assault weapons ban. Uh, so, I don't know, pretty, pretty fascinating. We're the first with the, with the rule. We published it. So, you know, you guys can go over to the reload and, and check that out if you want to see the details of it. Uh, but I think it'll have a very significant impact both on the American gun industry and American foreign policy. I mean, it's kind of an effort by the American government to impose gun control restrictions on other countries um, through the use of American exports. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of, as you wrote in a member's piece that re members can check out, it's sort of a continuation of a theme that we've seen from the Biden administration using the administration's limited unilateral powers to sort of go right up to that edge of where they can to do gun control both domestically and in this case internationally, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, well, up to this point, they seem to have gone over that edge in the yeah, court to, yeah. to the courts, courts yeah. right? Um, you know, most of those, their previous efforts have been ruled unconstitutional by federal judges. Um, now, some of them are still in effect because they're still going through the appeals process, like the, the ghost gun ban, for instance, was uh, the Supreme Court, in fact, stepped in to put a, a stay on that. Um, I don't know that that, as I talk about in the piece, doesn't necessarily mean that the Supreme Court is going to side with the Biden administration on that. But but yes, this this is part of that continuing trend of the president trying to use unilateral power, executive power to implement gun restrictions that he can't get through Congress. Right. Um, and he's doing this in the lead up to his reelection campaign where, uh, you know, he's not doing well at this point. And he uh, also has not had good ratings on gun policy. And of course, as I believe you actually, I think you wrote about this back, it's linked in my current member piece, but these sorts of efforts also don't necessarily seem like the kind of thing that are going to improve his, his, his numbers on this issue, because they're the kind of stuff that's not really what gun control advocates want. They want bigger things that require legislation, like, you know, a nationwide assault weapons ban. Right. But they're also, and and I, it's not hard to know if they'll even notice something like the pistol brace ban, even that, which is a pretty expansive policy, to be fair. Like that's millions right. of people affected, but it's not something the average voter has probably ever heard of. But it, at the same time, 
it, the people who are going to hear about it are going to be, be the people affected by it who don't like it. Right. Right. And so uh, it's not a great recipe for boosting your polling numbers on, on that issue. But um, I mean, it seems like, you know, he's trying, he's certainly doing his best to uh, try and meet the goals of the gun control advocates that support him. Um, at the very least, I think he's, he's probably making the groups happier um, who, who had been actually at certain points earlier in the, his presidency attacking him. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that plays out in the, in the coming months, obviously, but um, you know, the, this, this rule is in line with that domestic effort uh, even though it's, it, it's more of a foreign policy rule. Of course, that's another thing that gives him perhaps a little more leeway in court on this one too, is that, you know, this is, this is a foreign policy matter where the president has a bit more latitude and, and and we're talking about foreign civilians buying guns. Um, this is not military aid, by the way. So just to be extremely clear, I think that was fairly clear from the description, but this doesn't have any effect on whether we're going to send military aid to Israel or Ukraine, but this is all about civilian gun ownership or civilian gun sales. And obviously the second amendment doesn't cover foreign nationals in foreign right. countries. So he may have a little more latitude, although, What's hung up most of the other executive actions hasn't actually been the Second Amendment. It's been things like the Administrative Procedure as Act or the Rule of Lenity. And those may come into play here as well. So we will certainly follow that and keep everyone up to date. But, um, yeah, uh, I think that's all we've got in terms of news this week. What, what are your holiday plans, by the way, Jake? Do you have anything? Are you going anywhere? Yeah, so... Uh actually the day that we're recording this is friday before christmas eve i have a, a sort of a friend's christmas get together tonight that i'm going nice. to and then uh actual christmas or christmas eve technically sunday night i'm my girlfriend and i are going over to my parents house and my grandparents will be there and we're gonna have a nice christmas dinner then um and then a week later because my girlfriend's parents live in florida they split time but they live in florida uh we're gonna fly out to Flo florida for the first week of january to do sort of a late christmas with them too so i get Essentially three Christmases this year. Uh, I'm looking, <laughs> Lucky. looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I get something like that. You know, my, uh, I've got my dad's side of the family and my mom's side of the family, and then my friends, my close friends from, uh, from, really high school that I've, I've uh, remained close with for, for a long time. So we kind of jump around a lot uh, on the <laughs> during the holidays. Uh, they're all up in Pennsylvania for the most part, uh, but they all live in. Well, it's still southeastern Pennsylvania. That's a pretty big area. So it's, they're all, right. you know, 45 to minutes to an hour apart. So it's always an adventure to to try and hit every everybody that you got to give gifts to. Um, right. You got to work, work all that out. Um, and my dad's health is not great. So, you know, if, if people are the praying type, uh, you know, please pray for my for my dad. He's, he's uh, going through cancer treatment now, but uh, it'll be good to spend time uh, in person with him. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, although the Absolutely. Eagles are playing all on Christmas day. So, and I don't know how that's kind of <laughs> fair. Um, could be a bad Christmas. We'll see. They're playing the lowly giants, but God, who knows what they'll do at this point after. Wouldn't that be a stake row. in the heart for Eagles fans losing to the yeah. giants? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, uh, I'm still looking forward to seeing my friends and loved ones. If I'm not as much looking forward to watching that game. But uh, what can you do? I would have been an Eagles fan <clears throat> through both Doug Peterson era, eras when he was our terrible quarterback and when he won us a Super Bowl as a coach. So um, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. And realistically, <laughs> we're 10 and four. So it's not right. The, the, it is. I saw a great meme of like Eagles fans at 10 and four and giant uh, Lions fans at 10 and four. And it's that. It's that meme of the two guys on the bus and one's looking out at a shine. Oh, yeah. Happy, sunny side and the other one's looking at it like dark. And you can guess which side is which for, for that breakdown. But <laughs> yeah, very accurate. Um, anyway, I, I thought, you know, we, we put this, our little personal updates. I like doing them. And I think, I think people, uh, I think there are a lot of people who do enjoy this, but I put them after the news so that people who don't want the you know personal updates or the sports stuff can uh, can get right to uh, to our news updates. I think we'll start doing that 
going forward. But uh, anyway, that's that's all we've got for this week. If uh, Chris, if you want to support our reporting, and uh, th- that's what makes it possible. That's how we're able to publish things like that leaked document. Um, you can, of course, go to thereload.com and and pick up a membership today. Um, that's how we fund what we do here. That is that is our rock that keeps us going. So that is our foundation that we build off of. Um, and right now it's our only source of income. So, uh, and of course, when you buy a membership, you get access to hundreds of pieces of, of analysis and stories that you would not find anywhere else. So it's not just about supporting our reporting. It's also about getting, you know, getting your money's worth. That's what we try to do here. We try to do both, you know, give you a way to support what we do, but also give you real value for your, for your membership. Um, but yeah, that's all we've got for this week. We will, I will probably be back next week. And, you know, obviously Christmas makes it a little bit, we'll see how the schedule turns out, but, um, I am planning to try and, and do an episode next week as well. We will, but either way, we will see you guys again real soon.